So back to you, Herb, for a second. Um, tell us a little bit about why you wanted to make the film and how it came into being. Sure. So, um, you know, it's funny. We always joke that they're, uh, that in this world, there's sort of a, a gateway piece, sort of like a gateway drug. And a lot of folks who are, who are passionate about the American arts and crafts movement have that first piece of furniture that they bought. And that kind of opened the door to them and they just kind of went down a rabbit hole. That's very much what happened with my wife and I. We bought a, a, a Limbert rocker. Limbert was another manufacturer. And uh, that kind of opened the door for us. And we just started buying and, and buying books and doing research and and really sort of just fell down the rabbit hole of loving the, the movement and, and all the work of the movement and kind of the aesthetics and, and also the philosophy. And, uh, you know, we were not really in a position 30 years ago to try and make this movie, but we, we talked about it. I actually found some notes that we made. And, uh, and so it, it finally came around where it was like, you know, maybe we should try and do this. And, and, uh, and my wife, who was our production designer and graphic designer, she said, surely someone has made a movie in the last 30 years. And no one had, um, despite what, you know, what Bada said, people had probably tried, <laughs> but no one had crossed the finish line. So, uh, so what ended up happening was I, I realized pretty quickly that um, despite my sort of, you know, boilerplate knowledge, I needed to find a, a way into this world with, um, with the, the correct scholarly assistance. So that's when I reached out to Vonda and I said, I said, I don't, you know, you don't know me um, and you don't have to trust me, but I'm trying to get a hold of David Cathers, who really is the biographer of, of Gustav Stickley and really has literally written the book six times over on Stickley. And I wanted to get a hold of him, but he was literally invisible. I mean, he was Ted Gazinski. I could not find him anywhere. So I, I could not figure out how to get a hold of him. Vonda said, I'll reach out to him and see if he wants to talk to you. And that was how it sort of started. And being able to, to collaborate with David really um, opened the door. Um, ironically, about a month after uh, we first started talking, David said to me one day, he said, you know where you need to be? Uh, and I said, what do you mean? And he said, you know where you need to be? And I said, I said, okay, well, you, you want me to be in North Carolina at the National Arts and Crafts Conference uh, in three weeks? And he said, yes, you need to be here and meet everybody. And I said, David, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't have a hotel room. I don't have, I don't have the funds yet lined up. We're just starting to talk about this. And he said, you need to get here and I will introduce you to everyone. And so the other problem was my wife and I had had the conference on our list as a bucket list of things we wanted to do. And I went to her and I said, you know, I need to go and I'm going to have to go without you. <laughs> and so that was a little bit of an awkward conversation. Uh, but I went and, uh, and that was really the beginning of, of meeting everyone. And David was wonderful. He introduced me to, to, to Vonda and to Pete Mars, uh, who's on the board of the, the Craftsman Farms Museum and, uh, you know, the family and just everybody in the world, um, dealers, collectors, um, everyone. And that, you know, having someone be your sort of um, your host into the world and to kind of vouch for me and, and let them know that, yeah, we support this project was really critical. And that kind of started the, the odyssey. This was about a four year project, though. I mean, this was not a simple thing. Um, this and part of the reason, as you mentioned, I'm in Tucson, Arizona, which is not necessarily a, a hotbed of American arts and crafts. Uh, you know, locations is really more of a, of a, you know, northeastern kind of thing. So we basically spent a lot of time, you know, raising money and then flying east to go film in New York, New Jersey, North Carolina, Florida, Illinois, Michigan, you know, wherever the story was, we had to go. And, uh, and then we spent nine months editing the film. So it was a, it was a four year project and then COVID hit. So we uh, sort of delayed our release a little bit, but now, now we're out. Fantastic. And, and how did you find funding? Where did, where were you able to procure the funding to do it? It was, a, it was a combination of things. Um, there was a couple of small, um, you know, uh, crowdsourced funding through Indiegogo. We did raise some money through a couple of campaigns, uh, largely self-funded, to be honest with you. Um, the, the family <laughs> supported us a little bit. Um, I will tell you, I will be thrilled if 10 years from now the film is paid for. That would be an awesome <laughs> goal for me. Uh, but this was a, a passion project where we just, you know, thought to ourselves, if we're going to wait to raise the money, we, it may be, you know, we may not be able to do the movie just because it'll be too, you know, too long from now. So we just had to kind of bite the bullet and, and we have no regrets. Um, I, one of the things I always say about this project is, is that the, the real benefit to this was the experience we had making the film and the people we met. I mean, this is, we had 
We had bucket list experiences of visiting places we never thought we would visit, um, being able to be around some of the best furniture in the world um, and meeting the people who care for it like Vonda. And that's just really, that's really a, a gift. And I'm so glad that we captured so much of that that we're letting people see things that maybe they wouldn't be able to access uh, as a normal person. I can so relate to that in my own personal experiences working, creating a doc and yes, self-funding is kind of the way, unfortunately, that it has to go. And, but it's, it's always a testament when it comes out at the end and you've got the film and it's there and you sort of, it's almost like, you know, well, not in your case, but pregnancy, you know, the baby's out and, <laughs> and hallelujah, you know? So I totally understand uh, that that impetus to just keep going, and it does propel itself, uh, you know. Um, um, and so, how, where did you get your list of people to go and see and and talk to and and put that all together in terms of like the interviews and stuff? It was it was a very collaborative, um, you know experience working with with David Cathers. I mean, I, I went in kind of having an idea of, well, these are these are some high points, but he then would weigh in and say, okay, we need to go here. And you need these are the points that you need to cover. This is the this is where the story lies. And and as much as you think, um, and, and I this probably happens to every filmmaker, but you think you know where you're going and you think you know where the story is um, and it just takes you other places. And, you know, a, a prime example of that is one trip when we were up in, in, in upstate New York filming and, you know, we knew we were going to go to certain places. We were making our second trip to Craftsman Farms and we went to, to the, the, you know, the house in Syracuse where, where Gus did the first, uh, you know, in, interior. Um, and we were going to go to the cemetery where he's buried. And, you know, we were going to do certain things. And all of a sudden we were able to, through David Rudd, uh, to connect with, you know, the, the, the branch of the family that owns uh, the Skinny Atlas, the pump house at Skinny Atlas, and, oh, come on up and film, and then we were able to, you know, do things that we hadn't even thought that we could do, and so the story kind of, you know, weaved a little bit, um, but it, it still remained true to, to the original nature, and we really, I think we're lucky that everyone we wanted to talk to, we were able to, and, and a good example of that is, for those who have seen the movie, when we open on Ben Wiles, who is the, you know, the, 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 the grandson, kind of the last grandson of Gusta, who lived with him in, in, at the Columbus Avenue house. And he was 99 when we were able to interview him. And we got invited to his house and we went up there and we interviewed him. And to be able to have a first person recollection of someone, of, of a, a person you're doing the story about who has been gone since 1942, that's rare. You know what I mean? And to be able to, to ask those questions and to be able to kind of have to touch that that part of history was really spectacular. So, you know, it wasn't really like, I mean, I think if, if he had passed before we got to him, I would have been really sad. But everybody on our list, we were able to get to them. We were able to, to get into every place. We had weather that cooperated. I mean, really, it's almost embarrassing how, you know, it was, it was certainly it was a long haul, but it wasn't like, you know, we had, you know, tsunamis or floods or anything to deal with or fall, you know, trees that fall on buildings or anything like that. So Trees that fall on buildings. So Vonda, just catch <laughs> us up because that's a, a sparking point for you, isn't it? Uh, yeah, Herb, thanks for the memories. I <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was telling Christy that the museum is, she asked about, uh, we talked about visiting, it's only about an hour away. But we have the unique distinction of being closed because a tree hit one of our buildings and not partially because of COVID, but um, last August um, during a tropical storm that hit very hard in this area, but not necessarily all across the region, um, a, a very large poplar came down on, um, on one of the buildings. It's in the center of the property and we're trying to start rebuilding. <laughs> So it doesn't, it's, it's just easier to stay closed. And so we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. But um, actually, I, you know, since I can share screen, let me, I'll share a picture or two of, um, this is the tree that came down. <gasps> the antique oh, tree. No. And this is the building that Herb shoot, shot in, the log house, which is really Stickley's masterpiece. It is oh. the most important landmarks in the country. Um, so we were incredibly fortunate that it didn't land, the tree just landed short of that building. Oh, oh, oh. But the damage was extensive and um, the two buildings are connected. So it is, um, it will take some doing to, uh, this is there, and you can go to our website and also keep up with us, but that's how it, the building. Oh, works. no, no. So 
Wow. Christy, it's we were talking earlier today about why we were closed. I thought, let me just share a picture because they can tell the story. This is why you make movies and, and pictures, right? So the, I'm looking at the tree thinking, wow, that could be some great furniture. <laughs> right. And we we're fortunate that if you have all the places to land, it, you know, this, it landed where we would have, we don't want it to land, but it really could have yeah. done damage. Wow. But it's, it's fairly significant. Um, so, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll start with you, Herb. Um, how, how did, what, what, how, and of course you see the film, so you see what, what Stickley did and how incredibly overcome, overwhelming his contribution to this world of this type of furniture is and his world of it. And but as we talk today, I was fascinated by this sort of, not it, the, the lifestyle of Stickley and what that lifestyle meant and how he pushed that form of lifestyle. And you also brought up the fascinating sort of, um, I said re restoration hardware and you said Martha Stewart. So <laughs> between those two people, in terms of the lifestyle of the times, how did Stickley contribute to that? Sure, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna you know, Bonda, you know, just wave at me when I say something that's wildly off base. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think one of the ways that I, that I try and communicate Stickley's story to people who don't, they may know the name, but they really don't understand the depth of, of what his accomplishments were and, and what he was, he was so much more than furniture. Um, one of the things I, I talk about is I say he was a lifestyle entrepreneur. And that was the, the Martha Stewart kind of comment is, he was, you know, somebody who was not just content to sell you a piece of furniture and and see you later. Thanks for the money, sucker. Um, you know, the movement was so rooted in, in you know, the, the the idea of, um, you know, the things that he had he had observed in the English arts and crafts movement and the importance of, you know, not surrounding yourself by cheap factory made junk. It was it needed to be something that the furniture needed to be something that. Uh, displayed the hand of the of the craftsman that had made it, and it was made from materials that were that were important. And they, these were fur this furniture that was supposed to be made and handed down. It was not something that you would kind of wear out and then and throw away. And so, um, you know, the idea that um, that he kind of was he was about. And I think we're you know we start to dip into all kinds of ideas about you know post industrial revolution. And you start thinking about a rising middle class, and you start thinking about the ideas that you know he was sort of educating a, a whole new class of people in how to, how to be good humans and, you know, how to live and how to live respectfully and how to live, you know, a, a quality life. And the magazine had articles about how to garden and, and what, you know, what art to see and what, you know, what to do. It wasn't just about buy my furniture. It was about, this is how you're, this is how you can be a, a good person. Um, and this is, th these are goals. These are ideals that are universal and, some of these things, you know, continue to this day, which is why we don't talk about this movement as something that is, you know, old and dead. It's something where there's still people, you know, doing, uh, doing the making furniture that's in the style. We still see themes like, you know, uh, DIY is a great example, you know, working with your hands that, oh, wow, it's new again, right? Uh, farm to table, it's new again. That was something Stickley was doing, uh, you know, with his restaurant in Manhattan. Um, so I think it's interesting that, that he was somewhat of a, of a, of a pioneer in a world of kind of connecting all these dots. And he became the, the, the standard bearer for this movement. And, you know, yeah, the Craftsman Magazine didn't have the circulation of House Beautiful, but it had a lot of people that were looking at it every month and it really influenced a lot of people. And, uh, you know, if it hadn't been for, for World War I and hadn't been for, you know, some, some over leveraging, it might've had a different ending. I mean, I think it's very rewarding that we've, we've had the ending that the film displays where you know, this is not something that's forgotten. It, it has returned, but it, it's it, it's a really fascinating story. And when I think about his peers and I think about people like Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Tiffany, they have so much more of a household name and Stickley is even more deserving than some of these folks that have a high profile. And, you know, he didn't have the, the all the crazy ex-wives that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright had, you know, he wasn't a horrible person, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, it's like we can excuse the, the genius for being a little bit erratic. I mean, he was, he was, he was a remarkable human being and it's, 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 it's overdue. Very interesting. The World War I, tell us a little bit about what happened at that time. So he had created this kind of visual world and it was thriving, wasn't it? 
It was. And, I mean, and, and Bonda, do you want to jump in and talk a little bit about kind of that? Because you guys have definitely chronicled a lot of that through your collection. Yeah, he, at the time he moved to New Jersey, he had um, a magazine. So he was publishing. He had um, an architecture firm, a home building company. Mm -hmm. He had multiple furniture lines. He made anything that you could want in the arts and crafts style, curtains, rugs, furniture it was it was you know you could you could um have him design and build your house and buy all the furniture from him at that point and so at the same time he began building craftsman farms he was working on this plan for a building in new york city the craftsman building which herb shows in the movie and the idea for that was we might call it a, a department store today um the idea was at one stop shopping so if you were interested in this uh, the arts and crafts furniture he was selling uh, or craftsman that was his diet that was his really his um, logo and his brand we would call that um, you could buy it all there and if you were a, if you were a, a person who uh, subscribed to his magazine you could stop in and take a rest in the gentleman's lounge or the ladies lounge and you could stop at the restaurant and um, and so it was a it was an empire it was a business empire by the time he built Craftsman Farms. It was short-lived, but it was a multifaceted business empire. He was a tastemaker and someone who, it wasn't just a retail operation. He really did believe that, the, that, the, that what you surrounded yourself with really mattered and that it would make your life better <laughs> to have <laughs> objects that were well-made in your life. That was really at the heart of it. And, and, and I think, so, you know, yeah. I, I was going to say, I think, you know, what happened really was, um, you know, no one really knows specifically a lot of the details. A lot of the, a lot of the, 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 uh, the materials were kind of sadly lost. I mean, some are at the Winter uh Library, but I mean, he really kind of over leveraged himself, you know, in, 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 in uh, you know, in contemporary parlance. I think he, that building in Manhattan was a very expensive venture. Um, you know, he was overly optimistic about uh, the continuation of, of a very fickle public who decided that, you know, this was, this was furniture that, okay, we've seen it for a while. Now we want something new. And, you know, nothing is, is eternal. Things change constantly. And so the idea that he probably, uh, pardon the pun, you know, bet the farm uh, on some stuff and, uh, and, and he lost. And, you know, no one saw World War I coming. I mean, maybe some people did, but you know what I mean? It was like, there was probably a correction coming anyway, uh, but it, that was what happened. And he spent, sadly, he spent, you know, the rest of his life, you know, kind of a little bit slipping into obscurity and continuing to try and be, you know, be, do what he was passionate about. He was working on, on, on furniture stains. He was working on, you know, changing his line and trying to appeal to a, to a changing taste and, and never really captured that lightning in a bottle again. Um, but that, you know, and, and that's why it's so, actually that's why it's so refreshing and so good that, that it is appreciated now. It's not like it was just that 10 years or whatever, 15 years where it was beautiful and it was the top of the world. Who started the Renaissance of Stickley? Current so, day. So, you know, there, there was um, uh, Robert Judson Clark, uh, there was a, 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 a thesis, I guess, a PhD thesis, I guess, um, and it was a Forgotten Rebel. That's technically what it is, Bonda, right? It's a, it was a master's thesis, which is very interesting to me because, you know, it was whose master's thesis becomes the start of a revival? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> um, and I, I've spoken to the, uh, John Crosby Freeman is his name. He wrote it in 1966. Um, but I would say the real launch was um, what you said, Robert Judson Clark was at Princeton University and um, they held an exhibition of arts and crafts furniture. And that really was a very high profile exhibition and, um, and kind of put it on the map for people, but partly because of their reputation, but, and, but also because it was the most that a lot of people who, had, who might've been interested saw it all together in one place. At the time, you just, you really had to seek it out and, and to see it gathered in one place was unusual like that. Yeah, and I think that, you know, it, it's almost like, we talk about it in the film, it's almost like it, it took, you know, uh, these, 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 um, these, these disparate collectors were sort of passionate about it, and, and you meet some of them in the film, but, you know, that, that Princeton show was almost, uh, was almost a stamp of approval, and it was like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, well, wait a minute, you know, this is not, you know, this is not 200-year-old stuff, this is, you know, 60, 70 years old, 
but there is something here. And then so the scholarly attention started turning towards it. And all of a sudden, you know, the, that momentum continued to build and then Sotheby's and Christie's and auction houses and then celebrities collecting. And then it just sort of, you know, the eighties kind of went nuts, uh, late eighties. But I mean, it was, it was, it's so interesting when you can trace back to patient zero and that that's exactly what that, what that is. <laughs> that, that thesis was just like, Hey, wait a minute, there was a guy and he was talking about stuff, which is pretty cool stuff. And, you know, let's, let's not forget about this. This was pretty radical and pretty, uh, interesting and and it and it's everywhere. Everybody's grandmother had this furniture. We all live in these craftsman bungalows. And where did that come from? It came from Gustafson. And when you say radical, what do you mean? Well, I think um, I think it was radical in in terms of the idea that you know this furniture didn't. If we just talk about furniture, this yeah. furniture didn't look like a lot of the other furniture. Right. I mean, you know, what I like to think of it as really a, a you know, even though it's, it's rooted in, in English arts and crafts movement, I like to think of it as kind of one of the first original American styles because we were so obsessed with, you know, colonial and, and you know, federalist styles and stuff like that going into this time period that to have something that really felt like authentically American was a little bit radical. And I mean, this, this is, you know, for those who, you know, don't necessarily know or thought, think, haven't thought about this, it's, you know, it's, it's big, substantial, weighty, you know, it's very different. You know, the furniture is very different. It's not, it's not like anything else that was happening. And so when it, when it came onto the scene, it was kind of like, wow, what's that? I mean, it really stood out. And then once it became popular, well, everyone got on the bandwagon and it wasn't just Gus's brothers. It was, you know, it was the Roy Crockers. It was, you know, everybody started making this furniture because it was selling, because it clearly resonated with people. And, and I think, it was just that it was maybe so different. It wasn't like it was punk, you know, I mean, it wasn't that kind of a radical thing, but it was very different than anything else that was out there. Vonda, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, I often compare it to high Victorian. If you think about um, a Victorian house that is uh, has heavily ornamented furnishings and every surface is covered with, there's something in it on every surface. This by contrast is really stark it's it's um it's intentionally the design is the construction so it's one of the things that that her pays attention to in the movie is that the construction is visible in the furniture and that is just one of my uh one of our longtime docents use this phrase and i'll never forget it it's the ultimate and the limit of 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 the decoration for him is showing you the design rather than he said a lot of the ornament ornamentation on victorian furniture Poor, covered up poor construction. And so he was very proud of the, um, sometimes I would say, we might say over-constructed, it's very heavily constructed furniture, but it's it still, it's, it's made it past a hundred years. Um, so, you know, it was very well constructed and, and it was intentionally so to draw attention to how well made it was and the idea that it was going to last forever. And also that it, it was like, the pieces of furniture, the designs were sort of what you what you needed it to be. You know, what should a chair be? What is the point of a chair? What is what do you need it to be? No more and no less. What is this table for? How can we perfectly suit that purpose? It's kind of, a lot of times people compare it to shaker furniture. The mm. shaker furniture is intended to represent, it's a manifestation of ideas, simplicity, honesty, um, uh, uh, the kinds of, there's another word that is economy. There are things that are ideas that they believed in and their furniture represents that. And that was, that's very stickly in the, and it wasn't just, oh, this is a pretty design. It was supposed to represent a, a cluster of ideas that he really cared about. And in terms of his labor force, um, how, how, how did that differ from other labor forces? Well, I think it's um, it's it's interesting um, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, he being uh, you know uh, like all of America, being you know an immigrant, first generation, um, uh, you know, American. Um, you know, he was his labor force was made up of, of a lot of a mixture of, of 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 Americans from a lot of different places. But also, I think what's really fascinating about his labor force is his collaborative nature. And we touch on it in the film a little bit, but I mean, you know, sometimes, um, and I, I hate to be throwing shade at Frank Lloyd Wright, I seem to be doing that tonight, but 
um, you know, a lot of times, you know, the master uh, doesn't necessarily recognize the people who are also working with him. And Stickley was very upfront about his collaborators, and that's Harvey Ellis or Lamont Warner or Irene Sargent. I mean, these are people who were really, really amazingly talented people. And he didn't just kind of push them down and say, my name's on everything. I mean, you know, he was basically saying, here you go. I mean, Irene Sargent wrote the first two issues of The Craftsman. Her name is in the byline. That's radical, you know, at that period of time to have a, a, a you know, a woman being kind of acknowledged for all that work. And she was, she was brilliant and he acknowledged that. Um, so I think, you know, the idea that uh, it wasn't necessarily like the studio of, of, you know, Michelangelo, right? You know, it wasn't just like, and now all of a sudden we're learning, oh, all these other people were really good, <laughs> but he took credit for it all. So he was very um, open to that collaborative nature. And I think it was also something where, and, and Bonda can talk to this more than I can, but the idea of Craftsman Farms too, was that it was going to be a boys school and it was going to be a place where where a next generation of craftsmen would be trained in how to do the work of, of a craftsman. And that might be woodworking skills. It might be, you know, anything like that. It wouldn't necessarily just be, you know, get your, your education and then make money and go off and buy whatever you have. It was like how to be self-reliant. That was a really important thing about how to, how to the part of the, the whole MO. Fonda, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, his, um... He had a factory, you know, it was, he probably had around 200 workers. Um, when he initially made the shift into making, he, he made lots of different styles of furniture um, and continued to, but eventually arts and crafts was predominant, craftsman furniture was predominant. There was an effort to try to share profits with employees. Mm -hmm. It didn't, it seems to have not lasted very long, but I think that it that shows sort of his intention of what he wanted to do. And I agree with Herb that um, one of the things that's exciting about, um, you know, pre representing Stickley is that he he employed a lot of women. And I, I, I tend to think that maybe he didn't partner very well with men because they didn't last very long. So I think partly, you know, he needed, he, he was the boss in many ways, but, but he, he's right. There were, the, there were two editors of the Craftsman magazine and they were both women. And they were both really impressive women. Irene Sargent and um, her name will come to me in a second. Um, uh, and, and then also um, he, there was a designer named Eloise Rohrbach who worked for him and many, but she wrote, she designed, she designed um, the stair rail at Craftsman Farms. So women had opportunities um, working for him. And I, I think that's, um, I just think that's really cool. Yes, thank you. Mary Fanton Roberts, whose name escaped me. <laughs> so, oh, the brain. <laughs> there's a beautiful, uh, you can look up Mary Fanton Roberts online because there's a beautiful portrait of her that's kind of famous. So um, she was a very cultured woman and um, he, he really, um, you know, he clearly was not threatened or didn't seem like it by having, um, putting women in positions that were important. He had an eighth grade education. You know, he needed people around him to, um, I mean, I, that's what I've always assumed. He went to school through eighth grade. He went to work because his parents divorced and his mother moved them from Wisconsin to uh, Branch, Pennsylvania, where they had family. And his uncle had a chair factory and he went to work in the chair factory. And he clearly was cut out for the chair factory business and, and did well in it, but, um, and had, and was a great visionary, but he would have needed designers and architects and writers to support the vision that he had. And I think it's easy to, it's always hard to know who did what, um, you know, because he collaborated, like, like, like Herb said, he collaborated a lot. So you don't really know where, what he did exactly. But I always think that the genius of being able to share a vision and have it across multiple businesses, <laughs> I have a hard time. I run a small museum. It's very hard to do with seven people. <laughs> so, you know, so I, I just think that's it's it kind of incredible that he was able to do that even for a short time. Yeah, it was he had that kind of leadership quality and he had a vision. And then he found the people that he could work with who could help him put that vision together. Yeah, um, and it still inspires people. That's yeah. you know, it's just amazing. That's that's you know, that's just such a yeah, you were talking earlier today about Donald Judd. You want to riff on that a bit? Sure. Yeah, I was just telling that I came to Stickley from a, a contemporary art museum. And um, 
So this was entirely, I, I, it's, my learning curve has been very steep. Um, and Stickley itself, Arts and Crafts is a, is a nationwide, but not a big community if comparatively. So um, when I first came to it, it looked like Donald Judd furniture to me. Um, if you've ever seen, there's not a lot of Do Donald Judd furniture, but um, I had seen it in a couple of museums and I didn't want to mention it because I knew that people would be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> And then, and then you skip ahead to five years, and we loaned a, a stickly settle, stickly sofa to um, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art for a Donald Judd furniture show because he was so influential. On Judd, he, he was he Judd owned stickly furniture, and it majorly influenced how he thought about furniture. So um, I was right, <laughs> but you know, I I was coming from a whole different standpoint, and the furniture seemed very modern to me even though I had, you know, I, the fact that it was over a hundred years old at that point was just, I, it just seemed like, it seemed, it could have been much more modern as far as I was concerned. I didn't know. Cool. Um, do we want to open this up to anybody who wants to ask questions? Uh, should that be something that we want to do now? Uh, Vera, what do you think? Uh, well, yeah, if anybody has- if, if anyone has any questions, we can also keep going, but if anyone has any questions, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, we don't have anything in the chat right now. So if I a, looks like- I have a Natasha. question. Okay. Yes, indeed. Um, either one of you two, um, what was his relation to uh, Hubbard and Roycroft and also, when he went to England, did he spend time with William Morris? And could you expand a little bit on that relationship and influence? I'm gonna let Vonda take that one. Sure. Um, Morris was about 20 years older than Stickley. So he would have, he would, I think he passed, or maybe, even, yes, he passed away in the 1880s, I believe. So they would never have had an opportunity to meet. But Stickley did go to England. He was, he was a su successful furniture maker before he was famous. <laughs> So he made a lot of furniture and did well, and well enough that he was able to travel. And um, that's how he, he was introduced to the English arts and crafts movement, partially through travel, and also because he, Irene Sargent was a professor at Syracuse University, so he would have been around people who was aware of the movement. So he definitely refers to Morris and, and John Ruskin as influences, but also the transcendentalists, uh, Emerson and, and Thoreau. Um, we're also, so the English movement is a little different from the American movement, but it really is the beginning of the arts and crafts. And there were handicrafts movements really around the country, around the world, I mean, at this time. And there's an American one that what ran from 18, mid 1890s to about maybe 1920 or so, something like that. So Stickley, it hits just around the right time. He's has enough money to be able to invest um, his business in really full full force in this when he's interested in it. Roycroft, uh, Albert Hubbard's community in um, East Aurora, New York, just outside of Buffalo, he starts a community. Uh, um, Hubbard is pretty wealthy. He, he was a soap salesman, very successful soap salesman. And he starts this artisan community. So. Craftsman Farm, Stickley's community, is really a home and farm. It was going to be a boys' school, maybe a community there, but Roycroft is really an artisan community. And there's multiple buildings, and, they're, and they were never all owned by one person. Um, they also produced furniture like Stickley did, but it was, all, it was mostly on commission. So Stickley had a retail operation, like multiple, multiple places in catalogs. Um, Roycroft mostly made things um, by commission. So there was, so they, um, so there's not as much Roycroft furniture, but they also had a very successful metal shop. They were working in the same style and they obviously would have known of each other. We don't have records of them meeting necessarily, but they weren't that far away from each other. So they would have been aware of each other for sure. The only arts and crafts people who really we used to talk about today, who we know Stickley sought out were the Green and Green Brothers who um, were out in Pasadena, California. Stickley made a point of going to California and one of the things he wanted to do was meet them. And then there were, it was at least one issue of the Craftsman dedicated to that trip. Um, any other, thank you for that. That's really, 
I hope this is all being recorded because it's amazing. <laughs> well, and Roycroft is a great place to visit. I should say yeah. if you, it's not that far either. I mean, it's a hike to Buffalo, but it, they've got a hotel. It's a great, it's a beautiful. Oh, place. how cool is that? Roycroft Inn is beautiful, very well, very well maintained. And I'm going. Good and friends there. <laughs> also, we should also mention that the Grove Park Inn in Asheville, North Carolina, uh, where the National Arts and Crafts uh, Conference is held every uh, February, that is was fully furnished and was a commissioned Roycroft project. And so you go there and it's really the most immersive kind of experience you can have because you're just surrounded, I mean, by these massive fireplaces. And it's just, it's such an amazing opportunity to just dive in if that's something that's at your back. It's like you can stay in a green and green building, but it's, it's, uh, you can actually stay there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. It, it, is, it is a world-class hotel and spa. Um, but I, and yeah, I agree. It's, it's like, if you can, if you're interested in arts and crafts, um, if you, it is expensive to go, but I would definitely say I've gotten to go. This is my first time. We they didn't have it this year. I had it virtually, so um, I've been twelve times, and it is um, a pretty incredible experience. It's kind of like landing on planet arts and crafts, <laughs> <laughs> all arts and crafts all the time. So, um, but it really is immersive, as as uh, Herb said, and it is a very it's a really friendly community. So that's in Nashville. Yes, that's in Asheville. I love yeah. Asheville. It's such a yeah. great town. So. Asheville in February. It's not bad. <laughs> I, can I just, I've been, Easter, I've been to East Aurora many times mm. and I highly recommend it. It's just, you know, it's without lovely. 45 minutes south of Buffalo mm -hmm. and it has, there's a neat inn, the Roycroft Inn, which is not overly expensive and you can tour and uh, it's a beautiful little uh, town, but, uh, and it's it right is. near Chautauqua, just north of Chautauqua. So, and Buffalo was the one of the wealthiest cities in the world in the 1800s. So they have wonderful architecture. Frank Lloyd Wright has buildings there. Uh, and they, uh, uh, what's his name, would design Central Park, design, I can't think of his name. Olmstead. Right. Olmstead. Olmstead yeah. did their park system there. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's not just Niagara Falls up there. So, <laughs> no, it's we're great. talking we, about we touring. Yeah. Roycroft is great. Um, I believe the Roycroft, they, they uh, maybe not in season yet, but they have continued to be open. And the Roycroft in and the right their copper shop is fantastic so yes. oh my god <laughs> yeah it's a great it is really a great trip the darwin martin house is beautifully preserved if you like frank lloyd wright's houses um it's really i've been in a lot and it's one of the the, the new york state really invested a lot in um in it you can also see um gray cliff um which is about 30 minutes from there but uh darwin martin house is worth a visit alone it's really incredible mm -hmm. Ah, this sounds like a great trip to take. Linda, do you have a question? Um, no, I was just gonna say I stayed at the Grove Park Inn. I think it might've been the first time I was really exposed to arts and crafts, um, except for maybe your house at one time. But um, <laughs> I um, was fascinated by the decor of the rooms. I mean, you know, we stayed in a room in, in the Grove Park in, in December in, in Asheville. So very snowy, um, wintry time there but it was beautiful and I was very that, that claim to fame is also that Zelda that Scott Fitzgerald stayed there a lot because Zelda was in the sanitarium there yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, interesting so it's oh god these sound like such great trips my goodness yeah <laughs> any other questions from anybody any thoughts any observations I have, I have, a, here's something from a chat. Um, uh, Marnie Klippinger, who's actually joining us from Boston has said, um, is this, sound, this sounds a little bit like Tiffany and how do they compare? Um, Tiffany is older than Stickley. Like, you know, like some, he came before Stickley um, and there, but there, I mean, there is overlap. People who collect Stickley often collect Tiffany as well. Um, and we have done a class on Tiffany, so I should know more. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I think there is overlap for sure. Tiffany, though, tends to be kind of like Frankly Rise's own thing, you know. So I would say he's sort of claimed by arts and crafts, but definitely has it, you know, it's a world unto itself because Tiffany is, 
it's you know it's it's the it's uh, lighting and it's uh, art and it's also church window you know it's really all encompassing so it is arts and crafts I would say but it, it's really kind of its own thing too. I, I, the thing that you said that made me think of Tiffany had to do with his his workshops and the way he worked with women. And yes. Yeah. So I, I, there was just a lot that sounded sort of reminiscent of the way Tiffany is known to have worked with the people who worked for him. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I hadn't really thought about that way, but it's true. Well, and I think also, and, and Vonda, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think also Tiffany ended up being um, in an in a, in a environment where there was a lot of commissions. And mm -hmm. so there was you working for a lot of people like the, you know, the Morgans and working for kind of, you know, large industrialists and doing some of these projects that were very well funded. And so it was, it was sort of an interesting, you know, he was working for a, a, a class, if that mm -hmm. was. You know, and, it was a different know, business model. Yeah. And, and I think Stigley's model was like, you know, was more every, everybody, right. Even though, even though the furniture wasn't always priced for everyone, but I think it was not like, you know, for, you know, titans of industry to, to you know, yeah. do the ridiculous Morgan Library or something like that. So that it's a little bit different, but I mean, I think they were in tune with, uh, you know, trying to for, to push forward the value of craftsmanship and the value of the artist and, the, and, and, you know, kind of bringing, bringing that fine art to, you know, to everyday items, you know, in a way. So. And as, and in terms of the economics uh, structure of it all, what was this aimed for middle class purchase? Middle class, yeah. I think he would have liked to aim it to the middle class, but it it was just enough. The prices were too high. Yeah, it's similar to the stickly furniture that's made today. I would say in the in the like, it's very well made. It's it, you know it's an investment. It's an investment. Um, but um, I think that's it's kind of what how we usually capture it that it, we think you know I think he would have liked to put the furniture in everybody's house but you still had to be of means to a certain extent to afford it. So Herb what are, what are your plans for this wonderful film? Uh, well so we uh, as you mentioned we um, we debuted last Friday and we're on about 51 or 52 virtual screens in about 23 different states right now and so that that virtual rollout the film will be out for a little while that way and then uh, in the fall, we'll be we'll be coming out with a you know the DVD version of, of the film and and uh, hopefully start to do that. And then I'll probably be setting up every February at the Grove Park Inn during the National Arts and Crafts Conference at a folding table with a box of DVDs to sell <laughs> for my life until I can pay everyone off. Um, but uh, you know, and it, it's funny we were talking earlier. We had a, a conversation a, a little while ago, and and somebody asked me. They said, "So, how much film did you shoot?" Because that's always an interesting question. Uh, and we actually shot uh, uh, just over twenty four hours of film. Um, and the, the the film that we have out there now is just over an hour long. So somebody said, "Well, you know, wh where's the rest of that film?" And and uh, it's it's all living on multiple hard drives uh, and in the cloud. <laughs> Funny thing about it is, you know, when you do a narrative feature, you do a feature where you're you're acting, you're not a documentary. You know, you have multiple takes, right? So somebody can say, "Oh, well, I've got you know, um, you know, 47 takes of this one scene, and we just picked the best one." This film, you know, we didn't do multiple takes because you're doing interviews, right? I mean, you're and so you're grabbing the most salient pieces. So you know, there are little nuggets here and there that I think it would be fun to kind of, you know, maybe somehow get that information out. Like here's, here's the full Ben Wiles interview, or here's more of, of you know, this or that or whatever. Um, but we've got to, we've got to get through this, this release process. And then, and there may be some more life, uh, you know, in, in the, in the project, but also, you know, these are like children, uh, films are, and you, you want to kind of launch them and, and hope that they, um, they go and they find a life of their own. And, and we're working on, a couple of other projects right now that we're, we're, we're trying to, you know, get more of the money up front this time. <laughs> <laughs> I know about that. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Where is the arts and crafts movement today? Good idea. It's, you know, it, it's, it's alive and well, I mean, is the thing that I would say. And I think, you know, the most telling um, statement about uh, the most co compelling proof of that is the National Arts and Crafts Conference every February in Asheville. Uh, you know, a thousand people gather uh, every year uh, for for uh, events, and then it, it, the, the the fascinating thing about that is not only is there this 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 vibrant community that gets together for thirty plus years now, but also 
there's an antique show that takes place at the at the Grove Park Inn, and then outside of that, kind of in a ring around the antique show, is the new makers. And so you see all these craftsmen who are who are not necessarily just you know paying homage by doing some of the same designs, but they're they're doing new things, and there's you know new people working in 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 the in the in the, the style yeah, and in the yeah. materials of the movement. So it's, it's, it's really kind of amazing that once it came roaring back after Princeton, it didn't go anywhere. And, and certainly the prices ebb and flow a little bit depending on the stock market and how much money someone has in their portfolio. But the idea that these, these you know, this movement and the ideals and, and the, 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 the objects of the movement are still relevant and they're still being, you know, this is not just, uh, it's funny, you go to the, the Arts and Crafts Conference and you think it's going to be a group of people that are all in the same demographic, right? You know, it's going to be like they're all going to be, uh, you know, older and white and wealthy or whatever that is. They're not. You know, there are young people there. There are people who are, you know, just starting out. There are people who are craftsmen. There are, you know, it's, it transcends so many of, of, uh, of, of those kind of norms, which I think is really heartening and exciting because it's not just like, okay, well, when these folks pass on, the movement will will, will cease. It, it, no, it's going to continue, and it is continuing. That's exciting. What are all those pottery bits behind you, Herb? So um, these these are uh, you know none of these are Grooby. Some of you would know the name Grooby, but uh, you know the, there's there's certainly a a pottery component to American arts and crafts. And uh, the green, the matte green, is is a favorite of my wife and, and mine. So those are. Those are sort of a, ver a variety of different uh, makers, but nothing is uh, nothing is something that you would have to like, you know, sell a car to buy. So they're, <laughs> they're, they're, they're very affordable pieces. Actually, a couple of them we bought at the Grove Park Inn over the past couple of years. So it, it's definitely there's a, there's a, some amazing uh, dealers that show up every year, and even if you're just a looky loo, I mean, just the, the the quality of stuff that you see and. And the fanaticism of people, they're lined up when the show opens and they're racing in to buy stuff before anybody else does. And uh, it, it's, it's really, it's, it's a lot of fun to go there. But yes, so that is, there's a, it's a, a lesser maker uh, sideboard behind me and there's uh, some pottery and yeah. So <laughs> I surround, I live in a 1907 house uh, and so we're uh, a mission revival house. And so we're, we're surrounded by, by, by the artifacts of the, of the movement and that, that made it so important. And I think, you know, and maybe Bonnie, you can back me up on this. I think, you know, coming uh, to this group and coming to, um, to this community as a filmmaker wanting to make a film, uh, it, for them to take me seriously, they had to, I had to be, I had to be um, part of that world. I had to be passionate. It couldn't just be like, oh yeah, this sounds like an interesting topic. I'll make a movie about this. It was like, no, I love this stuff. And I want to tell this story. And that authenticity, I think, gave me access and made people understand, oh, this guy's, he's, you know, he's going to do a good job. <laughs> you know, he's not going to embarrass himself. He's not going to embarrass us. He understands what this is about. And I think that was really important that, you know, the right person made the movie. And I'm not patting myself on the back, but I just think, you know, it, it's, it's something that, you know, you, you have to have more than a casual affinity for something if you're going to spend four years working on it. Well, I think you did a really fantastic job, seriously. And I, I'm, I'm fascinated with going down to Asheville to see that whole world. And I mean, it sounds like there's a whole world out there of people who enjoy this kind of work. And I think that you really encapsulated his, oh, and it's his birthday today, right? It is, happy birthday to Gus, yes. <laughs> happy <laughs> birthday to Gus. <laughs> 163. <laughs> oh, how? What? 163. 163. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Well, uh, unless anyone else has any other thoughts that they want to share, um, I think we're, we're probably good to go here. Anybody want to say anything more? I think I just wanted to say I think the film is excellent and it shows that you, you, sometimes you have to have a passion when you don't have money. But it really is beautiful. And the collaboration and the work and effort that went into it is just outstanding. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's been very hard. It's heartfelt. You feel the heart and 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 you know, it's put together beautifully. The music is great. I mean, all the elements are there. And uh, I'm glad that they opened up their doors and hearts to you, then you could make the film that you did, because mm -hmm. it's it's very worthwhile. 
Well, thank you. I just want to say thank you. Yeah, to, thank you. to you, Herb, to Vonda, and to Christy, thank you, and to Vera. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Wait, wait, wait. I can say something for you, Olga. Is that it? Can we say it? Can we say it? I just wanted to say. Who's talking? Oh, come on uh, come on board, guys. Hi, it's, uh, it's Ken Sylvester. I just wanted to say something real quick. Please. Do you, uh, I don't know if you hear me right now. We can. But, yeah, uh, you're I just want to say, first of all, I, I just really love the film. And uh, are you freezing? OK. Um, I, I really love the film. And I, I had my office in Morristown uh, many years ago. And I spent a lot of time at the uh, in Parsippany at the museum. And I was always very fascinated. You know, by him living there, uh, and I also know that he commuted into New York. I think there was a train stop, a flag stop, right on the property. Uh, uh, if I remember correctly. There's a, a, that's actually a myth, but there is one. He's, there's, there's like ten there. minutes away. It's easy to get so, to. Yeah, there was a little uh, there was a little trolley, and um, and it was yeah, easy. yeah. Train. He would take the train to uh, Hoboken, and then take the ferry in to the to his building in the city. And that's how all his food came in from the from the farm. They had trucks that they they took in, and so we have at least one picture of the trucks. So we think that's how they did it. But it would have been a haul, yeah, <laughs> to get the you know the the water and the dairy products, and it's a big undertaking to do that. Yeah, wow. Mm. Well, well, see if you've got a passion, you do it. Yes. Well, I want to invite everybody to, we are closed on site, but we have a very robust um, online programs. And um, well, how do they find you? What's the best way? Uh, let me put our website in the chat. You can check us out on our website, sticklymuseum.org. And we have, um, right now we're doing a campaign around Gustav's birthday. <laughs> um, but we have been running a class called Design and History, and it is, um, it sort of tethers back to Stickley, but it started in uh, Gothic, Gothic Revival, and we've gotten through, what did we get through to, uh, we, uh, we covered like a Asian uh, art, I mean, Asian furniture, its impact on the West, and um, I think then we're going to pick up the class again at the end of March. It's really been a great class. Our Director of Collections and Preservation is an art historian and um, he's a great teacher. So I'd recommend that if you're looking for something on Saturday afternoon. And then uh, we have a lot of member programs and um, we're gonna have a great visit to a Stickley uh, home, a, the home of a Stickley descendant um, to have a virtual birthday party in a couple of weeks. They're gonna take everybody through a tour of their home and their collection, which includes pieces passed down through the family. And um, so we, we do a lot to try to keep people engaged, even though we're not close, we're not open at the moment. So you're all welcome to join us. Um, check out our programs online. Sounds Super good. duper. Well, Herb, thank you so much for this wonderful film and Vonda, all of your wonderful additions to the story. Um, it's a great, great film and I, I wish you luck with it. I hope you know, everything works out for you and that it's everywhere, everywhere that it needs to be. Thank you, and, and thank you for inviting uh, myself and Bonda to come talk about it. We, we, we love talking to each other and with each other. And, <laughs> and, and, and thank you for, for, for having the film and, and thank you for being here tonight to talk about it. We're, we're just glad that it's touched people and, and that, uh, you know, we're hopefully, again, spreading the gospel of this is an amazing story and we just want more people to know about it. So thank you. Is there a website, Herb, that people should look uh, for? Or? You know, we, we, we didn't ever spin up a dedicated website, but we're on Facebook. So if you go there, you can kind of see, we try and post links to things. And that's where we would, we'll, we'll talk about when the film is available on DVD and things like that. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of the place to look How for. long, Vera, how long is the film available on, on our it, website? Uh, through next Thursday. At, at, oh, great. I understand. So you can tell your friends. Yeah, um, they can go through the Rivertown Film website and find the link to uh, to stream the film. And also there, we encourage you to look. We're also streaming at the same time a wonderful documentary called Stray, which is about uh, it, it's a, a stray dog in Istanbul. And oh, uh, no. <laughs> it, it's from sort of from the dog's point of view. So it's a, a, is the dog a, okay? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
I want to know that before I see it as well. The dog, it's the dog is okay. It's not dog lovers. <laughs> about Bambi's mother being shot. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> dog lovers. I'm worried about the dog, and I'd never heard of the movies. <laughs> yeah, dog lovers love the film. So you can watch it with your oh dog. Oh my god. We have is a this recorded. Movie. This is recorded, and and will be. Um, so I hope that everybody. Because I want my wife to see this talk back. Uh, Good. Good. Is it so? How do I get out of? We'll we'll be uh, downloading it and uh, posting it on Rivertown Films. You so you'll will the members get an email or something? We, yes, you okay. should. Or if you're a member, that's yes. great. If not, you can sign up for our e news on the Rivertown website, okay. and we'll announce uh, when you. it's available. Okay. And yeah. Thank you for coming and thank you for a fantastic discussion. I have my uh, post-COVID travel bucket list uh, <laughs> lined up. I'm ready to go. So I want to see Herb's house, 1907, Arizona. Whoa. <laughs> oh, snow. I know. I know snow, 80 degrees today. Thank oh boy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Super, Thank super. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.